Okay, the Ecology Notes Part 6 is going to be on the carbon cycle as well as its effect on climate. Um, also, I'm sick, so pardon my sick voice as we get through these notes. The carbon cycle involves a lot of important processes, but photosynthesis and cellular respiration are two biological processes that greatly affect this cycle. Remember that photosynthesis removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, fixes it into organic compounds um, using autotrophic organisms, and then cellular respiration is going to break down those sugars and then release carbon dioxide as a waste product as part of those processes. So therefore, recycling the carbon dioxide. There's a couple questions on this slide that I'd like you to read and pause and see if you can figure out the answer to these questions and then I will go over them. Okay, first question, how does the seasons affect the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and therefore the carbon cycle? So here you can see we're looking at seasonal changes of carbon dioxide and you should notice that um, during the warm temperature months, so coming out of spring and into summer, we see a drastic drop in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. And this is going to be because of photosynthesis. There's a lot of photosynthesis happening during that time. This is when plants have regrown all their leaves, and therefore they're doing a lot of photosynthesis, removing a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so we would expect those levels to drop. And then in the fall, when temperature starts to drop and chlorophyll breaks down, plants eventually lose their leaves moving into winter. You can see that that carbon dioxide concentration increases due to lack of photosynthesis occurring. And it would stay that way until we repeat the cycle. And once again, it's spring, temperatures are warm again, plants regrow their leaves. Down here, the question is, carbon dioxide moves into leaf and leaf cells through which biological process. This is actually a throwback um, to biology honors where we talked about the process of diffusion. So gases are gonna be exchanged through the stomata and that is going to be done through diffusion. Carbon dioxide will enter the stoma by diffusion. It will move from high concentration to low concentration into the leaf and then across the membranes into the leaf cells diffusion. Carbon dioxide is also present in solution as a dissolved gas. So that means our aquatic organisms also have access to carbon dioxide for their cellular processes. It dissolves from the atmosphere into the bodies of water and then these aquatic plants and algae that live in the water can take in um, that carbon dioxide and use it for photosynthesis. Um, unlike terrestrial plants where CO2 diffuses through the stoma on the undersides of their leaves, aquatic plants have stomata that are cover their entire surface. So that means they can use the stem, the bottom of the leaf, the top of the leaf, all parts of the plant essentially that are above ground would be able to be used to exchange the gases. We'd also have been talking about carbon dioxide being produced through cellular respiration. So we'll focus on the types of cells that we typically find high rates of cell resp in. For our um, producers, we typically find higher rates of cellular respiration in their non-photosynthetic cells. For example, their root cells. Their roots don't do photosynthesis because they're underground, but they would do high levels of cellular respiration um, because they still need to grow and do their cellular processes. So they're gonna need to make ATP energy for that. Animal cells do a lot of cellular respiration and contribute to CO2 in the atmosphere. And then saprotrophs and detritivores or other decomposers, um, when every time they do decomposition, that requires a lot of energy. So they're going to be going through a lot of cellular respiration. IB likes to use the terms pools and fluxes. A pool is going to be a reservoir of a particular element or nutrient, can be formed uh, or stored inorganically or organically. On a diagram, they're often gonna be stated in a text box. 
Um, and a pool can be any nutrient. So we can talk about pools of nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle, right? There's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, for example. So that would be a large pool um, of nitrogen. We can talk about the phosphorus cycle. There's a huge pool of phosphorus and sedimentary rock. Um, in this unit, we'll focus on pools of carbon in the carbon cycle. A flux is going to be the transfer of one element um, or from of the element from one pool to another. And these are going to be done through processes. They're typically going to be shown on diagrams with arrows. And so you can label each arrow as we're converting the nutrient from one form to another form within that particular nutrient cycle. Since we are focusing on carbon in this sets of notes, um, there's going to be three main carbon fluxes um, that are going to be done due to living organisms. Photosynthesis is a flux, cell resp is a flux, and then feeding relationships through trophic levels is another flux. Here's a diagram that shows um, fluxes versus pools, right? So these are all pools, the text boxes. Um, and sometimes a pool is going to list the amount with it. Therefore, you could do a little bit of math to figure out what's going on in the diagram. They don't always list these numbers, but sometimes they do um, if they're available. But then also notice that the um, fluxes are labeled with arrows. And again, sometimes these could have numbers associated with it as well. Here's another example that shows pools and fluxes without numbers, but also without the text boxes. So just because it's not boxed in, that doesn't mean it's not a pool, right? So um, <clears throat> this tree, for example, is a pool of carbon. This uh, animal is a pool of carbon. There's a pool of carbon in the atmosphere, things like that. I want you to pause the video, study this graph, and see if you can make sense of what's going on in the beginning of the graph versus later in the graph when it starts to level off. Okay, IB really loves graphs, and so you could see here early on that um, how much photosynthesis was occurring was limited by the amount of carbon dioxide that could diffuse into the cells. But at some point, the plant has plenty of carbon dioxide and CO2 is no longer a limiting factor. So adding more CO2 um, to the environment would not change how much photosynthesis is occurring because there is something else that is now limiting that particular process, some other biochemical limitation. For example, a different nutrient, not enough nitrogen, for example, um, to make proteins. Um, not enough phosphorus, for example, to make energy. Something else is limiting the cycle. So again, remember there are nutrient reservoirs that we've been talking about. We just called these pools. Specifically in the carbon cycle, we may refer to those as carbon sinks. So a carbon pool can also be called a carbon sink. It is simply a reservoir or storage facility for carbon compounds. Carbon can be stored for long periods of time um, in durable organic material, such as in trunks of trees. Trees can live for thousands of years. Um, or in things like coal or oil, for example, they can be stored in these things for millions of years. So these are good examples of carbon sinks. When this carbon is released, um, then that sink has now become a carbon source. And so there are different processes that we know that can release um, carbon from those sinks. For example, if we burn the trees, um, so through combustion processes or burn the oil or the coal, for example, that's going to release carbon, stored carbon into the atmosphere. So those things have now become a source of carbon. Um, or when the tree dies and decomposition occurs, um, that process will also release stored carbon. So therefore, the tree has now turned into a carbon source. The rate of decomposition is affected by several factors. One is water availability. They're going to need a certain amount of water to do the process of decomposition, but too much water can also limit the process of decomposition. 
um, because it can cause water logging to occur within the soil. If water becomes um, waterlogged, it can lead, or sorry, if the soil becomes waterlogged, it can lead to anaerobic conditions, um, which is where there's a lack of oxygen. So oxygen is also really important to the rate of decomposition because um, there's a lot of cellular respiration that has to be done during that process and you need oxygen for cellular respiration. Temperature also plays a major role in all uh, enzymatic activities and so since decomposition uses a lot of enzymes to break down the substances through cellular respiration, um, temperature would greatly affect that. Increase the temperature, increase the rate of decomp slow down the or low, lower the temperature slow down the rate of decomposition <laughs> overall ecosystems can also be referred to as carbon sinks and carbon sources so it doesn't necessarily have to just be um, one component of an ecosystem you talk about it could be like a tree um, but it could also be the overall ecosystem that you are referring to as an overall carbon sink or carbon source and this, of course, would depend on how much carbon dioxide is being removed from the atmosphere versus how much is being released into the atmosphere. If there's a lot more photosynthesis occurring within that ecosystem compared to cellular respiration, then there's a net uptake of carbon dioxide, which means a lot of CO2 is being removed from the environment. <coughs> Therefore, that ecosystem overall is acting as a carbon sink. It would be opposite if there was a lot of cellular respiration um, compared to photosynthesis because that outputs a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and so that ecosystem would overall be acting as a carbon source and ecosystems can um, start off as a carbon sink and then quickly turn into a carbon source it depends on what's going on in that environment so for example if a forest gets burned or cleared then that ecosystem would quickly convert from an overall carbon sink to a carbon for, uh, source. Here shows examples that are showing those um, sinks and sources and how if you had the numbers, you could figure out is that ecosystem currently an overall sink or source. And here's just another diagram showing a similar process. Some um, forms of organic carbon can become fossilized, in which case when they do, we call them fossil fuels because they are large sources of carbon storage um, in an organic form that can ultimately be mined for or used and then burned in combustion processes to um, release energy as a carbon source. And so there's going to be different types of fossil fuels. Coal is one example of a fossil fuel. But coal actually forms from a different fossil fuel um, first. So at first, as organisms begin to uh, decay or get broken down through um, decomposition, so for example, the trees die, other plants die, we have all this detritus material that needs to be broken down by decomposers, if that process is halted, if it gets stopped in some way and does not, is not able to finish, so therefore we would have incomplete decomposition, then we would form what's called peat. And so peat is, is that. Peat is partially decomposed, um, usually plant matter, that um, can be stored that way for about tens of thousands of years. And Peat is an example of a fossil fuel, but peat um, forms usually when conditions are anaerobic. So that's usually what would stop the process of decomposition is anaerobic conditions. And usually this is going to be in really wet areas where conditions become waterlogged. So think like swamps, marshes, um, landfill sites, things like that. Um, and water fills the air spaces in the soil. And so if water is taking up the air spaces in the soil, then there would be less oxygen in the soil. This is what causes the conditions to turn into anaerobic. When conditions are anaerobic, 
um, it leads to not enough oxygen to complete cellular respiration. Without enough cellular respiration, the process um, of decomposition gets delayed. And so this is what would um, lead to peat formation over time. Acidic conditions and lower temperatures also favor the formation of peat because um, low temperatures would slow down the rate of decomposition and you do often find acidic environments um, in bogs and marshes and things like that that will help favor the formation of peat along with the anaerobic conditions that would need to be met. Over time, peat can be compressed and heated um, over and over and over again, heat and compaction more and more and more until it gradually turns into coal. Um, coal um, can be stored as a carbon sink for millions to hundreds of millions of years. So coal can really be stored up, locked up for a long period of time. Anytime carbon is removed from the cycle, for example, when forming peat or forming coal, um, that mm -hmm. process is known as sequestration. Anytime we're releasing that stored carbon back into the atmosphere by burning the carbon compounds, we call that combustion. So coal is mined for, and then we burn it um, as a fossil fuel in combustion processes, which combustion is an oxidation process that releases a lot of um, <coughs> carbon compounds into the atmosphere. Another example of a fossil fuel is going to be oil and natural gas. And so these are really similar in their formation um, to uh, the formation of uh, coal. However, it usually forms under the ocean or underwater. And so what happens is organisms die and then they um, they like land at the bottom of the ocean and they start to get broken down. Um, through decomposition, and then over millions and millions of years, it will again go through heat and compaction, usually in anaerobic conditions. Um, and this will cause chemical changes to occur within those organisms that typically allows for two layers to form, a layer of crude oil and then a layer of natural gas. And this is going to form between the rock layers um, found in porous rocks. So these rock layers are going to trap the oil and natural gas. The oil is more dense and will sit on the bottom of that layer. And then the gas is less dense and will sit on the top. Most of this gas is going to be methane, um, which is another carbon uh, form, CH3, or CH4, sorry, <coughs> it's methane. And <coughs> there are lots of ways that oil and natural gas are, are um, used for. So again, we're going to use these as fossil fuels and burn them in combustion processes like um, to heat your house or to, you know, to, to fill your car up with gas, stuff like that. But how we get it is we drill. So you've probably seen oil rigs off the coast of um, our coast. Actually, when you drive up to Santa Barbara, you'll see a bunch of them, but they're drilling for oil out there. And when they do that, um, when they drill for the oil, they will also release some of this gas um, kind of as a byproduct because gas is so small it can escape through anything. So some methane will release into the atmosphere when, when we drill for oil. Um, and we'll come back to that concept later. But we can drill for both of these things, oil and natural gas. There are other types of animal remains that can become fossilized where carbon gets locked up and stored. Um, as a carbon sink for long periods of time, but these ones aren't actually fossil fuels. So for example, the shelled organisms that live in the oceans, um, they <clears throat> become fossilized over time. Their soft parts will decompose, but their hard parts will remain. So these are gonna be things like snails, clams, and other bivalves, um, the exoskeletons of coral, stuff like that. Eventually over time, um, it will go through heat and compaction and get fossilized into a type of sedimentary rock that's called limestone. It's the calcium carbonate that they made their shells out of that gets fossilized into limestone. 
Well, limestone is not a fossil fuel. We cannot burn it in combustion processes, but it is a large reservoir of carbon that does lock up carbon for a long time. Under acidic conditions, this uh, calcium carbonate can also dissolve back into the ocean, but under um, neutral or basic conditions, it tends to be more stable and just stays, remains fossilized on the ocean floor. Okay, moving into um, climate. Climate is very different from weather. This is important. Weather is very much what's happening in the moment. So for example, right now, it's 70 degrees outside, um, humidity levels are low, uh, it's not raining, so pre precipitation is zero. That's weather, right? That's what's happening right now. But climate is an overall pattern of weather that we can look at over periods of time. And so that's the big difference between climate and weather. So again, climate is gonna be patterns of these things. So we can look at, you know, last year, what was the overall climate pattern? Was it similar to now or is something different going on? We can look at the past decade. We can look at the past century, right? So we're looking for patterns of weather. Greenhouse gases are going to be gases that are emitted into the atmosphere um, that have the ability to absorb long wave radiation, like infrared radiation. That's what makes a greenhouse gas a greenhouse gas, is its ability to absorb long wave radiation. Not all gases can do this. If gases do not absorb long wave radiation, then they are not considered greenhouse gases. Our atmosphere is composed of a lot of different types of gases with nitrogen, N2, and oxygen, O2, being the two most abundant gases in our atmosphere, neither one of which are greenhouse gases. The reason nitrogen and and atmospheric nitrogen and atmospheric oxygen are not greenhouse gases is because they do not absorb long wave radiation. However, the greenhouse gases, which comprise less than 1% of our atmosphere, um, do uh, absorb long wave radiation. And when they do this, they trap the heat. This is important. This is a normal phenomena. We need the greenhouse gases to trap that heat because when they do that, they maintain livable temperatures here on Earth. This is known as the greenhouse effect. It is a natural phenomena. The greenhouse effect, effect allows for us to keep Earth at livable temperatures. Without the greenhouse gases causing the greenhouse effect, our Earth would be too cold to live in. This is very different than global warming. We will talk about global warming, which is an unnatural phenomena coming up. But for now, um, the greenhouse effect is a natural phenomena. It maintains livable temperatures here on Earth. Of the greenhouse gases, the two most significant greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide and water vapor. Remember that carbon dioxide is going to, carbon dioxide will be released um, by cellular respiration as well as combustion of biomass and fossil fuels. And then it gets removed by uh, photosynthesis as well as dissolving in the oceans. Water um, gets put into the atmosphere through evaporative processes like water being evaporated from the ocean or through transpiration in plants, which is the evaporative water loss from their leaves. And then it gets removed um, from the atmosphere by precipitation. Other greenhouse gases um, that are not quite as abundant in the atmosphere um, are going to be methane and nitrous oxides. Um, methane is emitted from marshes and other waterlogged habitats. It's also emitted from landfill sites where organic waste have been dumped. These locations tend to have high amounts of uh, microorganisms that are called methanogens. Methanogens are going to be microbes that release methane as a byproduct of their chemical reactions. We also find methane uh, 
um, gas being leaked when we drill for oil. Um, and then nitrous oxides tend to be released from factories or from car exhaust. Um, they're also released naturally um, <coughs> by bacteria um, and other agricultural processes, um, like the bacteria that are used in the nitrogen cycle, for example. How much each greenhouse gas impacts um, the amount of warming that's actually occurring is going to depend on a couple of things. It will depend on the ability of that gas to absorb long wave radiation because not all the gases absorb at the same rate. Some have a higher absorption rate compared to others. And it's also going to depend on its atmospheric concentration, which the concentration in the atmosphere also depends on a couple of things. Um, one thing that has to do with atmospheric concentration is going to be the rate at which it's released in the atmosphere, as well as how long it stays in the atmosphere for. And these are going to be things that vary much greatly between the different greenhouse gases. For example, water is released rapidly um, into the environment, but it only remains in the atmosphere for about nine days before it comes back down. Whereas Methane can remain in the atmosphere for more than 12 years, and carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere even longer than that. <coughs> um, another thing to think about is, even though methane potentially causes more warming per molecule compared to carbon dioxide, its atmospheric concentration is so much lower Therefore, it means that its impact overall is less. So carbon dioxide would be a much more impactful gas um, in the greenhouse effect. <coughs> the sun emits all kinds of radiation, um, but a lot of that radiation is going to um, be absorbed in the atmosphere um, by the ozone layer and never hits the Earth's surface. So of the short wave radiation that comes in, um, about 25% of that actually does get absorbed by the ozone layer. So UV radiation, for example, from the sun gets absorbed by the ozone layer 25% of the time. The rest of it the other 75% does tend to make it through um, and get absorbed by the Earth's surface. So this short wave radiation gets absorbed by the Earth's surface, but then gets re-emitted um, as a much longer wavelength, usually infrared. Of this re-emitted um, long wave radiation, about 70 to 85% of that gets absorbed by the greenhouse gases. The rest of it would get let through. Um, so it's this trapping of this long wave radiation that leads to the overall warming effect on the Earth. And here's a picture showing that. So most of the radiation is coming in as short wave radiation. Um, some of it doesn't hit the Earth's surface, but much of it does. Of the radiation that gets absorbed by the Earth's surface, a lot of it's going to be re-emitted as long wave radiation. And of this long wave radiation, some of it is going to get trapped by the greenhouse gases and lead to the overall warming effect, the greenhouse effect. To figure out what's going on today um, in regards to atmospheric concentrations and temperatures, we have weather monitoring stations all over the place. But to figure out what happened in the past um, is a lot more difficult. In one place, they've been able to um, study trends of both carbon dioxide concentrations and temperatures from the past um, is in Antarctica. So they can drill into the ice and they pull out these ice cores. And within these ice cores, there are trapped bubbles of air. In the trapped bubbles of air, they can extract the gases and figure out the carbon dioxide concentrations at that time. So the lower that they drill, the older um, that information would be, 
and then higher up, of course, would be more recently. From these ice cores, they can also deduce temperature using ratios of hydrogen isotopes within the water molecules. Therefore, we can see what happened in the past, what these levels and trends were of both temperature and carbon dioxide from the past. That way we can try and figure out, is there a correlation between carbon dioxide and global temperature? We are going to focus next on anthropogenic sources of climate change. Climate change is going to refer to that concept of global warming. So remember, the greenhouse effect is the natural phenomena of the greenhouse gases warming the earth to livable temperatures. However, global warming is the trend where the earth is increasing in temperature um, over time. Um, beyond what's natural. And this overall warming effect is called global warming. This is mostly caused by human activities. And so these are going to be the anthropogenic sources, um, which releases a lot of gases into the atmosphere. Humans over time have really influenced the amount of carbon dioxide levels, methane levels, and other greenhouse gases that are present in the atmosphere. These are going to be due to activities like combustion of fossil fuels and deforestation. The graphs below just show um, which gases we are Im impacting with the most. So for example, in this first pie chart, you can see carbon dioxide is the biggest part. So we're emitting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Next would be methane, other gases, nitrous oxides. And then this little sliver is the fluorinated gases. Those are going to be the ones that are known as like CFCs. Those are the ones that are causing the hole in the ozone layer. And ozone is a greenhouse gas as well. Um, this pie chart shows you like what we're using um, those things for. So by releasing these things, this is what we're ultimately gaining. For example, gasoline for our vehicles. Um, we use it to power uh, lights and electricity in our house. Um, <coughs> natural gas to heat your house, things like that. Scientists have realized that there is a correlation between um, recent carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperature. As carbon dioxide concentrations are increasing over time, so is the average global temperature. And this has really started since the Industrial Revolution. So as soon as humans industrialized um, the world, we were able to see that there's been a sharp increase in the emissions that are going into the atmosphere. And therefore, um, that's also when we're starting to see that sharp rise in global temperature. So you can see overall, um, the trends are the same for rise in temperature and rise in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, Scientists want you to, or IB wants you to understand that correlation does not always equal causation. And so they have found a correlation between carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperature. But since then, um, they have also found lots of evidence that leads to um, that there is actually causation. So the increase in um, carbon emissions in the atmosphere does lead to an increase in global temperature. So it's more than just correlation. There is, in fact, evidence towards causation. And here are some more graphs showing um, these types of trends. This one's temperature. <coughs> this one is carbon dioxide concentration. So again, same overall trend. And you can see that there's you know, a strong increase as soon as the Industrial Revolution happened. Um, this curve we're going to come back to on the next slide. It's a curve you see over and over and over again. This one specifically is from a weather monitoring station in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, that they started in 1958. And it, this graph is measuring carbon dioxide concentrations um, from 1958 until almost present time in these graphs. So I want you to um, pause the slide, and I want you to see if you can answer these questions, and then we'll talk about them. Okay, first question. 
why would they put a weather monitoring station here in Hawaii? And the answer is that it's because Hawaii is a lot less industrialized. So there's going to be a lot less human influences um, in Hawaii. So this makes it an ideal um, weather monitoring station, M much less influence compared to if you put one in like Los Angeles, for example. Why do the levels of carbon dioxide fluctuate during the year? Well, we've kind of talked about this already, where in the warm temperature months, we would expect a decline in CO2 as more photosynthesis is occurring, removing more CO2 from the atmosphere. And in the cold temperature months, we would expect the opposite trend, uh, less photosynthesis, so more CO2 being output into the atmosphere. And you can see that this graph shows both annual fluctuations as well as the overall long-term trend. This graph is known as the Keeling curve. You should make sure that you can name the Keeling curve. Um, if a test question asks you to explain or describe the Keeling curve, you should be able to do that without the graph. Like you should know what the Keeling curve is um, and what's happening within this particular graph. Um, Third question, there's a more pronounced effect in the Northern Hemisphere, why? Well, there's a lot more land in the Northern Hemisphere. If you were to look at a, a graph of the entire globe, you would see a lot more land mass. More land mass is gonna mean more people, more industrialization, more of all those things that are having these negative effects on the environment. And overall, this graph is showing that carbon dioxide has increased about half a percent per year since 1958. That's a lot. That's a big increase. There are examples of positive feedback cycles in global warming. Positive feedback is when the end product of a process results in an overall increase of the process that created it. So here's a couple of examples, and then there will be more in the study questions. Um, but one example is as global uh, warming increases, then the frozen ground, which is called permafrost, um, begins to thaw. And within that permafrost, there is detritus material that has been there for a long time, um, waterlogged, that now starts to decay. Permafrost is known for holding a lot of methane as well. So as this decay process begins to happen and the methanogens start to break down this uh, detritus material, they will release methane as well. And this methane is going to lead to an overall increase in global warming because now you're putting out um, a potent greenhouse gas. Another example is global warming has resulted in more droughts, um, drier conditions, which has led to more forest fires. Well, when forests are burned, that releases emissions. So now you have all this excess greenhouse gases being released. On top of that, um, these damaged forests don't have as many um, healthy trees any longer to remove those emissions from the atmosphere, which just further enhances the concentration of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, thereby increasing global warming. There's also what's known as tipping points. A tipping point is going to be when there's an overwhelming amount of changes that are occurring um, to the point where the ecosystem is, is no longer resilient. If we've reached a tipping point, then this is where the ecosystem can no longer sustain at that ecosystem, and it ultimately converts from um, one stable form to another. So it could convert into a different type of ecosystem. And a good example is in the boreal forest, which is going to be in the taiga which remember, that's where we have a lot of coniferous trees, um, so those cone-bearing trees. Um, because it's so cold, the rate of decomposition is, is slower than how fast the detritus material is actually building up. Well, with an increase in these temperatures, um, this has led to more droughts that are occurring, occurring and more browning. Browning is when the trees are no longer green due to dry conditions due to 
not uh, not enough photosynthesis occurring and the trees are turning brown, this enhances the forest fires. So when the forest fires burn, we're going to release a bunch of stored carbon from the coniferous forest. This may ultimately lead to a tipping point where the boreal forest cannot make a comeback as a coniferous forest. Instead, these forests have now turned from a carbon sink to a carbon source because of these fires. Um, after fire, we then have different types of trees that are able to move north typically. Um, so we often get um, more grasslands that develop in these areas or more deciduous forests, which are going to be like, um, like the big leaf trees, not coniferous trees that ultimately make their way north. And when these trees make their way north um, and replace the coniferous forest, these trees also tend to be spaced further apart, which then leads to less trees being there, which ultimately leads to, um, you know, more, not, not as much uh, carbon dioxide being removed from the atmosphere, which then, you know, further enhances the positive feedback cycle. We are seeing lots of effects besides just high temperatures, um, but that is one of the major things. High temperatures are occurring all around the globe, um, but these high temperatures are not evenly spread around evenly spread around the globe due to ocean currents. The ocean currents are going to push these high temperatures to different locations, and so this is leading to like warmer waters in some areas, cooler waters in other areas. Um, and ultimately is leading to major changes in climate patterns that organisms that live there are not used to. One thing we're seeing is um, in the warmer areas, an increased evaporation of water from the oceans. And so what this is causing is more dangerous hurricanes. So instead of having a lot of like the lower levels of hurricanes down here, category ones, twos, threes, what we're really seeing is less of those and more of the really intense hurricanes, the categories fours and fives, because these hurricanes just kind of feed um, on this warm water. And so it's putting a lot more water into the hurricane and just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So these are the really devastating hurricanes. We're seeing more of those. Um, in other areas, instead of seeing more rainfall, we're seeing high temperatures leading to drought. Um, which could lead to fires, right? So some places are prone to droughts and fire and others are prone to more rainfall and flooding. It really just depends on where we're talking about. There are lots of other examples as well um, that are due to um, these anthropogenic causes of climate change. One thing we're seeing is the melting of ice. We're seeing this in um, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And there are different types of ice that we're going to talk about as specific examples. Um, this particular PowerPoint has a lot of specific examples in it. You need to make sure that you do know them because they are all IB standards. Um, so you do need to know the specific examples in this set of notes. Um, but one kind of ice that um, we're seeing a lot sooner melting in the year is landfast ice. Landfast ice is ice that's fastened to the shore. So it's not like floating around, it's like locked in place. And in the Antarctic, um, the emperor penguins depend on this landfast ice for a lot of things. They like to jump off the edge and hunt directly off the edge, um, and they also use it for breeding. When the ice melts too early, um, then they have issues in both of those things, issues in hunting, um, and then also issues in uh, their chicks being able to make it. Um, they don't have as much ice, and so it leads to high mortality rates of their chicks. Then we have the melting of the pack ice. Pack ice is ice that does like float around and move around with the currents or wind. Um, walruses, for example, specifically give birth on pack ice. Um, and so with less and less pack ice, there'd be less places to give birth. They also um, like to rest their pups on it rather than on sh shore because the males rest on shore and the male walruses are so big that they often roll over onto the walrus pups and that could suffocate and kill them. So the females prefer to rest their pups on the pack ice where there's not as many um, walruses, but with less and less pack ice, they're, that's becoming more um, congregated as well. Um, disappearing ice is putting a lot of stress on the reproductive success 
of the walruses and also they use pack ice for hunting and um, with less and less pack ice they have to swim further and further to hunt to find pack ice to hunt off of and this caused them to spend a lot of energy to stay warm during that process because they will naturally lose energy from their warm bodies to the cold water. This is just a close-up picture um, of the pack ice and the walruses using the pack ice. But you can see it's they're pretty uh, on top of each other because the pack ice is less and less. Another complication that we're seeing is in ocean stratification. Ocean stratification is the natural separation of the ocean into these different horizontal layers that are going to be separated based on density. Um, cold water is more dense naturally. Water is the most dense at four degrees Celsius, and so it will sink. Um, the exception of cold water being more dense is ice. Um, ice is actually less dense than cold water because it expands and so it will float. But typically cold water will sink down to the bottom and warm water is less dense so it floats near the top. In addition to that, the more salty the water is, that also adds to the density and so that also causes the um, colder, saltier waters to sink to the bottom. And heating is done mostly from the sun, which just reinforces the arrangement of warm waters on top, colder waters sinking to the bottom. We do expect some mixing of layers to occur due to the tides, currents, and wind, which is really important because it helps to move the nutrients around. It helps to get some heat and gases towards the lower layers um, and nutrients to the other layers. For example, when organisms near the top die, like algae dies, we have this detritus material that detritus material sinks to the bottom um, and can be used by organisms there that don't have access to sunlight um, to as their food source and, and to get nutrients like nitrogen and things like that. Um, but eventually these nutrient layers below become very nutrient rich. And so we would depend on things like upwelling um, to bring those nutrients back to the surface. Well, the more stratified in layers the ocean is, the more difficult it is for the ocean to mix. And so the higher temperatures on top of the ocean increase the upper ocean stratification. So it warms the top layers, leading to more difficulties um, of mixing. On top of that, um, when the ice melts into the upper layers that's now warming, this adds more fresh water, decreasing the salinity of the upper layers, which also further enhances the stratification. Well, when we don't get these nutrient upwelling events due to these warm waters, like during El Nino years, then that's a problem for the organisms at top. Um, they don't have enough nutrients, and so it's they don't have what they need. Um, the autotrophs don't have what they need to make their enzymes, and then that ultimately limits the trophic levels. Warmer waters, waters also leads to less um, gas exchange, so um, less carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the water, which means more stays in the air, which ultimately increases the greenhouse effect, another example of positive feedback. And then less CO2 is also absorbed, which means there's less oxygen that can make it into the deeper stratified layers, which ultimately leads to organisms not having what they need to complete cellular respiration. This is just a picture showing ocean stratification, the different layers. <laughs> Another thing that we're seeing um, is effects on organisms that live in the mountains. These are called montane species. What's happening is climate change is leading to warmer temperatures at higher elevations, so on a mountain. And so when this occurs, it causes organisms to undergo what's called upslope migration. They can now move farther and farther up the mountain as the temperature is warmer. But the problem is, is the organisms that already are towards the top of the mountain have nowhere to migrate to. And so ultimately, if they're already farthest north, 
then as other organisms come in and migrate into their area, it leads to competition and ultimately can lead to competitive exclusion. Scientists predict that organisms, montane organisms that live in the temperate zones um, will be affected a bit less than organisms that live in the tropical zones. This is because in temperate biomes, organisms do have adaptations that allow for them to survive these you know, changes in temperature, these fluctuations, whereas in the tropics, they're gonna be a lot more sensitive to these temperature changes because they're not used to temperature changing due to the tropics typically being more stable. So global warming is going to have a much higher effect on those less adaptable organisms. We're also seeing similar um, changes in latitude changes. So this is different than elevation, but overall the trend is similar. We call these poleward shifts. So that means like as we move um, farther and farther from the equator, closer and closer to the poles in latitude, and the weather is warming, we're seeing more organisms being able to move northward, um, or at least towards the poles um, of different species. For example, North American trees um, that live in the northern part of North America are shifting further and further north. So now we have this, these deciduous trees that are moving into the coniferous forests and ultimately could replace those coniferous forests. Another example we're seeing is um, changes in insect life cycles. We are seeing in, that they are able to complete their life cycles much faster due to climate change. For example, the North American bark beetle um, tends to complete its life cycles in trees that are weak. And so it kind of takes over these weak trees um, and completes their life cycle. In warm temperatures, um, it leads to drought conditions, and this can actually cause stress on an entire tree population rather than just like some trees. And so if the entire population becomes stressed, um, it actually leads to a lot of weak trees, like the whole population is now weak. And this allows for entire like swarms of beetles to invade the entire forest. Um, on top of this huge invasion, these beetles now are also able in warm temperatures to complete their life cycle in one year instead of two. And this further exacerbates the issue. When they complete their life cycle in one year, they release all the new beetles in a very synchronized way. And so large amounts of beetles all emerge at the same time and can do one vicious attack. And so this can wipe out the entire forest. When they complete their life cycle in two years, development is not as synchronized. And so you get like small populations of beetles emerging. And so the attack isn't quite as intense because it's like smaller attacks at different times. Another thing that we're seeing occur due to an increase in global warming or overall climate patterns is going to be potentially the collapsing of different coral reef ecosystems. Corals require incredibly specific conditions to be able to form. They need specific water depths, specific pH levels, specific salt levels, specific levels of clarity, and temperature um, must be within range. So they do not tolerate well outside of these ranges that they require um, to be able to, um, to thrive. And so one thing that we're seeing is as we increase the carbon dioxide emissions, um, this is leading to more carbon dioxide being dissolved into the oceans, which leads to a decrease in pH in the ocean. So the oceans are becoming more acidic. This is called ocean acidification. This is due to spontaneous chemical reactions that happen in the ocean between carbon dioxide and the water. So as soon as the carbon dioxide gets into the water, it goes through a bunch of chemical reactions. You don't need to memorize these chemical reactions, but you should know that through a series of chemical reactions, um, hydrogen ions will be released and the ocean becomes more acidic. On top of this, it turns the carbonate ion that they need um, in order to build their shells into bicarbonate, which is something that they cannot use to build their shells. So this also removes important nutrients from the water, and so now they can't build their shells, their exoskeletons. 
In addition to that, acidic conditions also cause their existing exoskeletons to break down. So not only can they not build new exoskeletons, but they also are losing their current exoskeletons. Another issue they're having is warm waters lead to coral bleaching. And really, warm waters, it causes the coral to release their partner, the zooxanthellae, which remember is a mutualistic relationship um, between the coral and the algae. This relationship is partnered because the zooxanthellae photosynthesize and give carbohydrates to the coral. And then in return, the, carbo the coral will break down those carbs into cell resp um, and then give the carbon dioxide back to the coral reefs and they will then use it for photosynthesis and they cycle back and forth in that mutualistic relationship. Well, during warm temperatures, they release their zooxanthellae partner, which is what causes the coloration of the coral. That's why they're so pretty. And so it leads to coral being bleached is what that means. But what it's really doing is causing the coral to starve. And so the coral reefs are dying. Phenology is the study of timing of seasonal events in both plants and animals. Some of the things that are typically studied are photo period, which is how much time there is in a day, like the length of the day, and then temperature patterns. These are variables that are known to influence the timing of biological events. Things like when uh, a plant is going to flower is highly dependent upon um, photo period and temperature. Bud bursting, which is when conifer plants um, start to have their growth really start to occur. Um, this is going to <coughs> start their growing season and typically occurs in the spring. And then bud set is when they kind of close off and don't really grow as much. That starts in autumn, um, which is controlled by length of day and temperature. It's also going to be in control of kind of bird migration movements. Um, as well as when these birds are going to nest. Data on these particular things that we know are influenced by photo period and temperature patterns can help us uh, look for evidence of um, climate change, including global warming. Within an ecosystem, temperature may act as the cue in one population and photo period may be the cue in another. And if the timing is not all, if the timing is off and they depend on each other, this could most definitely cause complications. For example, in um, the spring, <coughs> uh, caterpillars are, um, because temperature is warming up, the caterpillars are um, forming earlier. They're developing earlier in the season. And, and this is developing before um, the bird nesting season because the bird nesting season is not affected by temperature change whereas the development of caterpillars is so the problem is is these birds depend upon um, the caterpillars to feed their young uh, specifically we're talking about the great tit bird which is shown here which is a specific ib standard and so since um, the reproductive timing of this bird is still at the same time yet caterpillars are developing way earlier they don't have the right food source to be able to feed their young and ultimately it's causing a lot of their chicks to die. Another example is in caribou migration patterns in Greenland. Caribou actually migrate in a very specific pattern with their young because they know when certain patches of plants are going to come up within that particular area and they depend on that, depend on that specific plant to come up in that migration pattern to feed their young. Well, if the timing of these events are off and plants are coming up earlier or later in the season, then by the time the caribou get there, they don't have the food source that they need to feed their young. And ultimately, this mismatch is causing a decline in their populations as they're starving. Um, climate change is also causing um, evolution in certain species. For example, in Finland, um, they have had increasingly mild winters over the last 30 years because it's becoming so much warmer. And so with more warmth and less winter means less snow coverage. Well, this particular owl called the tawny owl species comes in two colors, a light brown color and a gray color. The gray color blends in pretty nicely with the snow. Um, it's very light and very similar into 
the types of trees that would grow there and, you know, the, the cover, the snow coverage. But now that there's less snow on the ground, um, it's no longer an advantage for them to be that coloration. So instead, um, the brown ones have a higher chance of survival now. And so they're surviving, passing on the genes for the brown coloration to their offspring. And over time, we've seen the brown tawny owls increase in frequency within the last 30 years. And that's it for the part six notes.